Hello everyone. Let me fade that out. Good afternoon. Hopefully you can see and hear me okay. I am online coming to you live here from my home office and yeah, it seems to be working. Let me just cut the music. I don't think you can hear it anymore, but I can hear it. So let me that should cut it. Okay, good. Well, good afternoon. I think that's working. If you can not hear me, let me know. Otherwise, I guess let me know if you can. Um, say hi. Uh, I always like to see who's online. If you don't mind just saying hi in the chat, that would be great. So I can say hi back. All right. Thanks, Waffle King Jr. Good to see you and good for thanks for confirming that things are working. Hello, Emily Hall. Uh, so let me switch that over there. Hi, Amber. Good to see you all online today. Hi, Lil Delato. And Arrow, hello. <laughs> and Devin, hello. Um, yeah, good to see you all. So today I have a number of things planned and uh, in the last section, so the last live stream I just wrapped up before this one, um, I kind of had to rush some things. So I'm gonna try to do a better job of managing time uh, today, but I wanted to um, let you know that I, I intend to probably record some standalone videos for different parts of the instruction that's that's going to be involved today. So um, if I don't quite get to cover all of it today, if, if like the live stream, if I run out of time on the live stream, I will be putting out some more content later. Somebody's yelling. I don't know. They're okay. Um, anyway, uh, I, you probably, you can't tell, but uh, I'm coming to you with a slightly new setup here. I have a standing desk that I, I built over the past couple weekends. Um, seems to be working. This is my first day using it to stream, but it seems to be going okay. I have to kind of remember to move my legs because I did this whole thing because sitting down for three hours and streaming for three hours on Mondays, and it, has, it takes a toll on my knees just like sitting still for that long. Um, I, uh, oh yeah, hey, hey Wayne. I mean, W Clever, I'm trying to stick with the screen names. Um, but the standing still is also an issue, so I have to remember to kind of move my legs. Uh, my knees just kind of they get sore and swollen. I don't know why. I'm, I'm seeing a doctor for it. I'm, seeing, I'm getting physical therapy, but we still can't figure it out. It's not arthritis, but something else. Anyway, I um, hope you all are doing okay and that your knees feel better than mine. Um, so the uh, today, we're. I wanted to talk about the Internet of Things or... Uh, the ways in which things are connected. Our previous conversations had to do with the way people connect to each other over the web, the ways that the, um, uh, the bulletin board systems allowed people to connect to each other, the way the web allowed people to create content that connected to other content using hypertext, uh, which was, was one of several ideas for hypertext that existed. And so we talked about some of the um, prior ideas for hypertext that uh, came before the web and uh, didn't play out as well as the web did. So the web is what we have to work with. And the assignment or the exercise associated with the module with this module is going to be to build your own retro homepage. Um, I have not tried circulation sleeves. Um, I, I've had I have a compression thing. Maybe I could try it. I don't know. I don't think it's blood flow, but I don't know what it is. Anyway, hi can I see? Um, I'll, I'll try. I, I've, I've tried many things, um, and so far, nothing's to, uh, super helpful yet. Um, but anyway, uh, I don't want to get distracted. Uh, you, you got me off my train of thought. What I was talking about. Oh yeah, so uh, web, the web connects people, but uh, increasingly it is interesting, or it has become impossible to connect other things to the internet. And this is the so-called Internet of Things. And I wanted to put a couple of stories, give you a couple of stories to look at to help you think about. Um, this technology and these are two stories that come at very different times from di very different writers um, but they invite us to think about some similar things and arguably in some similar ways um, but their approaches are different and their context and their reasons for doing these things are different so uh, I'm curious to see what your thoughts are about these stories uh, I had a good discussion on the last live stream actually um, so hopefully that works as well but also I wanted to spend some time on today's on this live stream also talking about HTML and building your uh, retro homepage, which is your exercise, your, your programming type exercise for this module is going to be to build your own um, GeoCity style, old fashioned homepage. So hopefully I will have time to get to that after we discuss a few things related to these stories. So if you'd like, this is the, 
Um, this is actually the, the notes for today, the October 5th Internet of Things. And as you can see, I put a few questions in here, and these are the kind of questions that I'm curious about thinking through with you today. And if you, I put them all here though, so that if you feel like it, you can just sort of respond to or address whichever of these you think you'd like to or that you have some ideas about. Um, and also, of course, I want to talk about the two short stories, uh, the um, There Will Come Soft Brains by Ray Bradbury and Mother of Invention by Nanetti Okorafor. So uh, I'm, this is not a literature class, right? So I'm not necessarily going to you know, expect, I mean, you don't have to, uh, this isn't about like interpreting these stories necessarily, but these are stories that invite us to interpret and think about some important and interesting things. So this is a bit of literary kind of, kind of like a literature class here for today, at least. So, uh, but the idea here basically is smart, smart things, because that's often how we, uh, how we encounter the internet of things is through new devices in our home or devices that we've had, but they are newly capable in some way that has to do with artificial intelligence usually, or just being connected and automated through an internet connection. So my example that I experienced in my life was I, um, a few years ago, bought a new dishwasher and that dishwasher had an ethernet port in it and it came with a one foot ethernet cable. And I didn't know why. And I finally you know, found it in the owner's manual and it turns out it had an optional thing you could buy, like an, a, a Wi-Fi thingy that you could stick in there, uh, kind of in the under part where the motor and stuff is, and you could connect it to your your Wi-Fi, uh, connect it with Wi-Fi to your uh, to your router, and I assume uh, to an app on your phone, so you could control your dishwasher remotely. I guess um, I didn't look that in, I didn't look into it very much because it didn't seem like a good idea to me. Also, you'd have to pay for that thing to stick in there, which you know I didn't feel like doing so. Uh, I never really investigated it further, but I am kind of curious if you have things like this in your home, if you have things that are connected, things that are smart, um, and if so, what they are, and if, you know, if if not, why not? I, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting possibilities, and some of them may be kind of surprising. So what do you have in your house that is smart? Um, and you see I have a tab up here. This is a Twitter account, the Internet of Shit, which... So they're slightly inappropriate name here, um, but they, this is a, I don't know who runs this account, but they, um, they use it to critique smart technology or internet of uh, things kind of technology, um, pointing out problems with it or making fun of it in general. So what do you have basically? What do you have in your home that's a smart thing? Uh, or what have you heard of? Or what have you seen? What kinds of smart things are there? Um, Trying to think, I did not get that dishwasher, so I don't have that. I, I have various, um, yeah, I have various smart Alexa devices. If you can count Alexa being in something, uh, that's definitely that. But I don't have anything hooked up to Alexa. Like I can't turn off my lights with Alexa, for example. So yeah, I also have that Fire TV. Well, I have the stick, right? So I, I uh, it's it's in there and it's connected. And I guess it is useful. Like I've, we found, like we use it a lot for. An intercom system so like if you need to find somebody you say to Alexa send this announcement and if somebody's watching TV with the fire stick it actually comes up on the screen with whatever text you said it even has graphics we noticed like so when it's dinner time there's like a picture of food and when it's like I think there's a couple, there's a couple others that I was surprised at like picked an appropriate graphic for the uh, for the announcement which is pretty interesting um, yeah smart TV yeah I think smart TVs are increasingly common and Certainly an example of smart connected technology that literally needs to be connected to the internet or some kind of system. Yeah, uh, or smart fridges, definitely. So, so, yeah, I guess the question then is like, do you think that's a good idea? Um, so yeah, so the, I just posed this question to Kennedy. These things, yeah, so Megan seems to disagree uh, that these, or seems to think these are pointless. So what would a smart fridge be smart about? Um, what would a smart fridge know that I don't? Yeah, the Google Home, oh yeah, you can turn on the TV with it. You know, I wonder, I bet I could do that with the, the Alexa thing. I bet it could, because I, I can turn on the TV with the Alexa remote. I bet there's a way to do it with the voice commands. That's a that's an interesting idea. <laughs> I, I'm wondering. 
Yeah, the smart watch, right? I mean, watches are already technology, and so they can be kind of more, right? I mean, that's something that makes sense. But I, I kind of want to spend some time with the smart fridge. Yeah, so they suggest recipes based on what you have. That's kind of interesting, right? Um, I think they can also tell you when you're out of stuff. Um, yeah, checking your temperature would be useful, I think. I mean, that's something like if you've ever had an issue with your fridge, figuring out what the temperature inside is, is kind of important. Then, you, you know, if you're, if you're worried that your cooling isn't working efficiently, then you do monitor it frequently. Like I, we've had an issue with that. So I think it can, yeah. Um, but I think you have to scan the barcodes of things when you put them in. Like I think there's something there's there's um like you have a milk and then like you there's like a barcode scanner or something that puts that in and says like oh yeah that's milk and then it's it knows that you have that milk and then it's I don't know see like that's that's the things like I don't really know how it knows it, it seems like weight or like camera sensing would not be reliable enough um, so I don't know yeah it just it's just too much exactly right so it's it's just you're doing you're doing the work. Um, it's not doing the work itself, so it seems like it's not really, it's just adding a new problem. It's not really solving the problem. Yeah, okay. Right, so it tells, like it checks on what's on inside of it. I, I do think, I wonder, uh, I bet there's plays, I bet there, is, I'm sure there are ways that if the smart fridge knows what you have and what you're about to run out of, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's a way that it can like pre-populate like an Instacart shopping list if you use the Instacart app to shop. Um, which I've been doing that recently, and it's it costs a little bit more, the groceries do, and I, I'm not a fan of that. It doesn't always disclose how the prices differ from what you would get if you just walked in the store, but overall it's for, very convenient. Um, but I need to do a little bit more. I've only started, re started doing it in the past few weeks, and very convenient, but I need to learn more about kind of how much that surcharge actually is because you have to pay like $1.99, each time you use it, which is fine, but then it's like, I've noticed that the prices of things seem different than what I remember from being in the store. So I need to check. Anyway, it's convenient. Um, what about like, um, uh, what other smart things have you, have you heard of or seen advertised? So basically like, um, especially things that really shouldn't be uh, especially things that should not be smart like um, somebody I think Jesse Bear pointed out or, or commented that they, their parents avoid things like that because they think everything electronic is spying on them um, and they're you know not wrong to be concerned right I'm not I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna say that everything is spying on you I'm not that cynical but I think that it's always possible so yeah smart toothbrushes um, what does that do Like, how does a smart toothbrush, well, I guess, does it, like, smart vacuums, yeah? What does a smart vacuum do? <laughs> what makes a vacuum smart? I mean, Roomba is a kind of smart vacuum. It's in the sense that it just, I guess those just go out. Do any of you have a Roomba? Or, a, you know, I'm sure there's different brands, but the idea of, like, the little robot vacuums like that's a, a smart vacuum in the sense that it I guess drives itself around and decides where to go I don't know if there's any like dirt sensing in it or if it just has a random path and then sort of uh, edge and cliff detection um, <laughs> okay um, yeah what does it do how can you tell <laughs> Um, I mean, do they just sort of, my, my feeling is that do they just sort of drive until they bonk into something and then turn and then drive and then bonk into something and then, um, oh, okay, so, yeah, okay, so basically it doesn't do its job well, <laughs> okay, um, okay. yeah, that's, I mean, I guess it's good. That's so, De so Devin. I guess that's 
a good thing, right? If it's, I don't really know much about my personal gum health, so maybe if a, if a toothbrush was prompting me to think about it more often, I might take care of it before it became an issue or became something else. I don't know. I bet a, a smart toothbrush would probably have an app associated with it, and I bet that that app would probably have a way of recording whether you used it or not and how long you brushed with it, and I bet that it could reward you or kind of um, help you track like a streak, and like it, let's say you brush your teeth twice a day for a week, it might give you like a sticker or something. I can imagine di different ways it might motivate you to use it as a product and also tell you when you, maybe if it has a head, you could, it would tell you when you need to replace a head, uh, or maybe if you stopped brushing your teeth in the morning, it would like be like, hey, you gotta do this, you know, I'll send you a push notification, uh, or it'd be like, hey, have you thought about flossing and that kind of things to try to push, you know, health on you, but push different products. Um, okay, yeah, so that makes sense, a little gelato, yeah. Uh, again, the, as long as it's doing the job, right? I guess that's that's Jesse's concern. If it's not doing what it's supposed to do, then it doesn't matter if it's smart or not. Um, yeah. Oops, I didn't mean to do that one. I meant that one. There we go. Yeah, I'm doing emoji reactions. Yeah, so interesting things that are possible and, and um, sometimes good things, sometimes confusing things are, are possible. Uh, someone else in the last section brought up a smart salt shaker. Um, really a small, like, I guess a, a smart salt, uh, I guess it's a salt dispenser, um, not really a shaker. I don't think it shakes. I think it's like a little tabletop robot. Um, on this Internet of Shit website uh, or Twitter account, they talked about a few things recently that were kind of interesting. I think the um, this thing, the uh, ring. So do any of you have ring doorbells? Uh, these are things that, it's a camera, right? And it's, it, it's a doorbell, but it's a camera, and it, it records, and it, I think you can talk. Like if you're home, if you're not home, you can talk through it to whoever's at your door. So you can be like, "Hey, I'm at home," or you can be like, "Hey, stop stealing my package." Um, but I guess they've also got this in-home security drone now. I don't know. Um, it's not out yet, I guess. But it's it's or it wasn't when this was written. I don't know when this was written. Yeah, it's just just recently published. So I guess this is a good idea for some people. Um, I don't know. It's could be useful to drive around your house if you're not home. You can kind of check in on, you know, different parts of your house. Um, okay, great. So, uh, Little Gelato has a smart toothbrush. Good. Um, I think, uh, uh, I, I, I guess with, with the idea of a, of a camera, I think uh, some of the implications might be a little bit more obvious in terms of how that might be a bad idea, but what do you think? I mean, what are some risks um, uh, that could <laughs> could crop up? So let me type it in here in the chat. So are you all ready for an in-home flying camera? Bot. So yeah, the Internet of Things has now brought us this uh, to this point from from Amazon. What do you think? Good idea, bad idea? <laughs> um, pros and cons. Like, what would uh, I guess? What would some of the pros be? I think the cons are sort of obvious, but um, or hopefully they are to you. But I think they are. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I am as well. Yeah, and they can. Um, right, so there's a, there's the use case. So, um, exactly. So, Devin, if you were out of town, I mean, you can put in-home cameras. Lots of people do that, uh, that you can access remotely. Um, and there are definitely advantages to that, uh, I can say. Uh, I don't have them myself, but my, my parents do. They have some uh, security cameras in their home and outside their home. And so, uh, and I can actually log into it. Like, I can, I can check their security cameras. Um, they live in sort of a remote area. It's not really remote, but it kind of is. So, um, sometimes weird people come down the driveway and they shouldn't. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we can keep an eye on with the uh, with the smart with the, the internet connected uh, security cameras. Um, also, though they have one in their living room, so I can like if I want to like call them, I can I can log into their security their camera to see if they're home and awake. And then if they are, then I can call them. Um, but it's uh, yeah. But yes, LG Perez, that was a thing that had happened. Um, that people logged into it. And that, really the issue is, okay, two, there's I guess two issues. Whenever you put in a security camera, 
um, there's like a question of like, does this really solve a problem I need? Uh, are there risks with kind of algorithmic surveillance and surveillance capitalism? Like there's, there's that kind of issue. But then the issue that, the other, that Lillian uh, is pointing out is that um, a lot of times whenever a company puts this kind of product out there, they don't, or at least historically, there have been some really high profile examples where they did not do a great job of, of securing it. Um, so there was a, a time period, I'm, I'm sure this doesn't work now, I hope this doesn't work now, but there used to be a website you could go to that would just give you access to unsecured camera feeds. Um, like people that had left their security cameras passwords on the default basically. So like if you buy a new security camera, you install it, um, it comes with a, you know, the username admin and the password something. And so people had kept theirs, they just hadn't bothered to change the password. So you could just kind of log into and look at anyone's security cameras. Um, I hope that that doesn't work anymore, but that's the kind of thing that did happen. And there was a case where, uh, it was taking me a minute to find it. So uh, LG Perez, if you can find it, that would be great if you, feel, if you don't mind sharing it, if you, if you do find it. Uh, but there was a case where somebody did that and they were saying creepy things to a kid through the um, uh, baby monitor. And obviously you can imagine the harm that that could cause uh, there was, I remember there was one case where, um, and this was recorded, I think, so there's a video of it where the hacker or the person that gained access to the system was trying to communicate to the homeowners, hey, you need to change your password. Like they were trying to be helpful, but they were like in their home systems, like, hey, I got in here very easily and here's what you need to do to make it harder. <laughs> but a very creeper, creepy interaction, very unexpected interaction. Um, I mean, I would hope that Amazon does a better job of security, but we, we can't know. And we, we, the, the mistakes that, that even major companies make sometimes are really can be pretty shocking and, and harmful. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of cons we can imagine to that. So if you do find that article, uh, LG Press, please share. Um, so the two short stories today the, uh, that I wanted you to look at have a couple of interesting things in common and also a couple of really big differences. So with, with fiction kind of readings, I often like to start with uh, kind of first impressions and questions. So do you have any questions about either of these? Um, the, this first story is Ray, Ray Bradbury, There Will Come Soft Rains, published in 1950. It's very much a, a Cold War kind of story. It has to do with a future in which the world has, um, well, I guess I'm spoiling it, but it's a very short story, as you can see, it's a single page, so hopefully you've already read it, if not, it's right there, uh, where uh, in this future, the um, there are no people, at least not in this area, and but the, the smart house continues, the smart house keeps going. And what I was watching, by the way, and when you, on the countdown, when the stream started, that was the, let me see, I can probably just find it on YouTube real quick. Uh, the, uh, it was the a video produced by Westinghouse, the um, appliance maker. Let's see. Oh yeah, there's a lot of these actually. Young man's fancy. What is that? Um, so, uh, as you can see, all my weird YouTube recommendations. Um, Westinghouse Electronic Home. That's what it's called. Yeah, retrofuturism is an interesting rabbit hole to go down. Uh, often, this is yeah, this is it. So. I'll mute it, but this is the, and, and you can see all the recommendations over here are further examples of um, like futurist, retro futurist, so things from the past that were about the future. And in this electric home, all kinds of cool things are possible. I'm just gonna click to some random points. So they got this light switch, which is uh, controls this door. Um, so they can have separate lounging areas, I think. I don't remember. Um, I think, yeah, that's their, their fireplace. Can you believe it? And so basically they're, they're having their friends over for dinner and they're showing off their new house. That's the narrative of this thing. I think that's the refrigerator. Yeah, it's like a cooler. So it's like a table, like a countertop fridge, I think. I think that was the idea. Um, they've got, I don't know what that is. That's something. <laughs> they, later on they, let's see. They have a school system in there. So like, yeah, they have homeschooling. They have all this electronic gadgetry to help them learn at home. Let's see. Yeah, oh, there's his work area, his work, his power tools all hooked in. My neighbor, my old neighbor used to have a tool like that. It's a really powerful <laughs> bandsaw 
thing that you can strap other things onto. So it's like a spinning thing, but you can have different attachments for like a brand saw and a drill press and table saw. Pretty cool. Um, yeah, at some point they have, they like push this button and their whole wall converts into a TV. I don't remember where it is, but yeah, there's the control center. So, you know, it's a very complicated home, but this idea of like, this is the future, uh, kind of makes sense. They're, they're basically making this argument for this technology. This was a real demo house. Like it, it really existed as a physical building. Um, there are several others of these, uh, the plastic house of the future is another great example. Um, this was at Disneyland and I, they did make several of these. These are, but it's a house literally just entirely, entirely made of plastic. And that's kind of the exciting technology of the future from the 1950s. Uh, everything's kind of eggy and rounded and weird. Um, pretty cool. So there's that one. There's another one. There's another one called, um, 1999 AD, uh, which is from even earlier, I think. Um, when is this from? It is not from 1999. It's a lot more psychedelic as a film. Uh, I don't know, but yeah, this is this is a cool part where she's trying to decide what to make for dinner. I think. Where is it? Maybe that's a little bit later. Oh yeah, this guy's scuba diving. This video is great. I just, um, <laughs> Oh yeah, then they have their friends over to watch TV, basically this giant TV. And uh, yeah, they have these like futuristic, like Star Wars clothes on and stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, and then, they, um, but there's a cool part where, oh yeah, he's a scientist. Oh yeah, and he's doing school, multiple choice tests uh, on a computer. Anyway, this is a great video. I recommend it uh, very much. So uh, again, uh, what these are, what these all, all have in common is ideas about the future through the home. And I'm interested in this idea of how the home becomes this thing for learning about the future, um, this, this place to imagine the future. And connectedness seems to be a big theme. Oh yeah, thanks, Selena. I just see you just posted it, so thank you. Um, so I, I'm interested in how both of these stories raise their raise these ideas and use these ideas of the future through the home to think about some problems really, and to, to kind of imagine some some scenarios that could arise. So do you have any questions about either story? Any plot questions in particular? I think there's uh, definitely some reading between the lines that you need to do for Mother of Invention. Um, a little bit for Soft Rains also. Um, what do you think? Any questions? Um, and I'll just go ahead and give you what I think is the big question that I'm interested in for both of these is um, both of these are about a future. Both of these are about a smart home being a thing in the future. These are also both set in the context of apocalypse. So for There Will Come Soft Rains, there's a nuclear holocaust. Uh, for uh, Nanetti Okorafor's story, Mother of Invention, it's an ecological apocalypse. Um, in that story, I don't know if you, this is one of the things you kind of have to read for, but uh, it seems like there has been widespread, widespread ecological destruction, devastation, and chaos uh, at this point. Um, I don't think it ever says what year it is, but it's in the future for most. And, uh, but there's this invention, this super grass that has been invented, peri grass, that is super resilient and solves a lot of problems as a, it's a food source, it helps with erosion. Um, rice is extinct, so this is a, a replacement for that as a food source. Uh, but it it also it, it upends the economy, so it becomes a, a resource for Nigeria. And so Nigeria is kind of this um, has this rich uh, it's this rich source of this particular uh, plant, right? But it's a other than that, like it's still in the context of apocalypse. And because this is science fiction, every uh, you know new technology brings new problems, and so this uh, causes a particular problem for our narrator who is giving birth, and so she need some help with that. So I saw somebody typing for a second there, but um, what do you think? Um, why do you think both of these are set in the context of an apocalypse? It's a little bit less of a global devastation, I think, for Mother of Invention, um, in the sense that it, you know, there's devastation happening, but it's localized, and the consequences are, are more personal. Um, whereas for soft rains, it may, it, it implies that it's a global apocalypse. Because it says the bombs start falling and then 
more bombs. And really pretty disturbing. I mean, the, the, the imagery is really vivid in that story. And that's one thing I really like about Ray Bradbury. Um, he can come up with these big ideas, but he can really connect you to the moment of those ideas or the moment of living with the consequences of those ideas. Um, I think his, source, his story, uh, Fahrenheit 451, for example, people kind of take it as a story about censorship, which is incorrect. It's not at all about, about censorship, but they also they focus on the book burning, but it's really a beautifully written book. He has a great way with uh, language and description, and you can really see that even in this short piece, uh, which is a little bit earlier. So I see typing, so I'm going to see what you have to say. Oh, um, maybe it's set that way in the Mother of Invention to show how much the house can do to help the pregnant woman. Yeah, sure. I mean, that makes sense that, that it gives um, the house a real problem to solve, right? Um, there's a real problem for, uh, what is her name? I'll get the link. I'm trying to remember that. I blanked on the, the main, uh, Unwilly, yeah. So it's Unwilly has this problem of that she's about to give birth and the house is aware of it, right? And needs to be helping. Fahrenheit 41, is that your endorsement arrow? <laughs> yeah. That's a good point, Jesse Bear. I, like, I hadn't thought of that. Like, the idea is that it seems so far away that we don't have to deal with it. But And that's that's always the, the double-edged sword of, like, any kind of climate change thing or anything that has to do with climate change because, I mean, it is changing. Like, we are experiencing it changing, but it's a very gradual change. So um, you kind of have to go there pretty far to get really dramatic things happening, like, in the story. But then the risk of that is, like, it seems, oh, that's... 10 years from now, you know, before rice goes extinct. Um, so you, we, you know, we can worry about that when that happens. Um, but of course, that's not true. We have to worry about that right now. Um, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Well, I, I guess one thing I want to make sure, do you get what happens at the end of Mother of Invention? It, it's uh, one, you, know, you have to read closely for it, so I want to make sure you are reading closely, I guess. Okay, so it's showing you that, that the smart house will always be there for you. Um, yeah, I guess so. I, but I think there's definitely a um, like a darkness to it also. And that's, so there's an interesting way to read into this story there will come soft rain. It's like there's a point in the story where the house reads a poem, it chooses a poem. Um, of course, that that poem is that choice is not totally random. The house uh, has chosen this because Ray Bradbury wanted this story to be here, and this is the story that gives us the title for the story. Um, and notice what it says: "There will come soft rains in the smell of the ground, and swallows circling with their shimmering sound, and frogs in the pools singing at night, and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathers, feathery fire and whistling their whims on a low fence wire." And not one will know of the war. Not one will care at last when it is done. No one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that he were gone, that we were gone. Um, so there's a kind of beauty in that poem. It's referencing beauty, but it's noting the, um, I guess one takeaway from that poem is that humans aren't necessary for nature to be beautiful, um, for these things to keep being. And that's, I think, kind of chilling. I think that's sort of the, the kind of awe that we experience in nature sometimes is that it is there, that it is beautiful, but that it is there without us and that it does not need us. And that's a humbling feeling. And that's something that we should, should feel. I think that's something we should experience whenever we can. Um, but it's, um, the question then is where does technology fit in that? Is technology part of that world that no longer needs us? Um, or is it our way of changing the world, but not for the better. Um, I don't know. That's the question. And Devin, I, that's not quite right. I think, like you're right, it does suddenly switch focus right at the end. Uh, let me pull it up here. So this will be a spoiler if you have not already read it, but I want to go ahead and make sure this is clear. Um, so yeah, so down here, so uh, yeah, Bayo, this is, he's the uh, ex-fiance who secretly had another who already had a wife, right? Um, so, yeah, if you'll notice, so think about what happens with Anwili and Obi-3. 
uh, OB3 has detected that um, or has predicted that Unruly is going to have this specific allergy and is, is likely to be, it's likely to be fatal. And so uh, Unruly has been taking steps to prepare for this. And this, th that preparation had to do with building like an egg type structure and like legs so it could walk. Uh, so it's, it's prepared for, uh, for this. By by doing that, and it's prepared because it knows it's an extension of her body. It's, it, the house is an extension of its occupant, and it it lives, it exists to serve her needs. It just it knows about things that she needs that she didn't know herself, and so it preemptively prepared itself. Um, if you think of that, then uh, their house Ob One is the Ob One is the other house, and Ob One has also adapted itself to fit the needs of its owner, its central occupants, who is the other woman. And um, if you know now, it says here, neither his wife nor her house were the type to easily let things go. And then he says, why did I make these so, <laughs> houses so smart? And he sat down and held on for dear life. Um, I think that the house, this house has, whereas OB3 became protective, I think OB1 has become aggressive. I think OB1 has, has taken the uh, malicious attitude of the woman who lives there and extrapolated that into preparing to go fight this other woman. <laughs> like uh, So OB-1 and OB-3 are about to have a um, giant robot battle, I think, <laughs> is what is about to happen at the end here. So I don't know, this is, uh, it's, a, it's an idea of how technology is an extension of us, but the, the risk of, <laughs> of it being too smart can mean that it might make decisions for us that actually don't serve us. And I, I like the way that this focuses on a really personal kind of consequence. Um, whereas a lot of times when we look at like AI taking over and the problems that AI might introduce, we tend to think of it kind of on a global scale, like Skynet and Terminator. Um, and that's fine. But I think if we look at it in a more narrow sense like this, a more focused sense, it, it can be a little bit more um, compelling. And I think it can make us think differently. So I really like both of these stories for that. Uh, but also for thinking about the kinds of things that we expect of a home and how the idea of the home comes to be to begin with. Um, the idea that Ray Bradbury here is talking about in the 1950s, right? I mean, this is 1950, and that's really when the idea of suburbia, uh, of a suburban home, was really created. It was like the 1950s. I mean, it's, it's definitely it's a 20th century phenomenon, the idea of, of the home that's being described here. So when you talk, when you see these things like year 1998 AD, we're talking about the far future for home technology, uh, smart home technology, they're also defining an idea for what homes are for for the present. Like they're saying, this is what we do in our homes. We do these things. Let's imagine this fantastical way of doing them. But it's kind of teaching a, an idea of domestic life and a purpose for domestic life that you know, was not uh, globally available, that was, was not even um, universally available in the United States or anywhere. Uh, this is um, a, a construction. Like this is something that came to be because people wanted it this way. And so uh, if we think about the suburbs, uh, as a 20th century invi in 20th century invention, we have to think about um, the the racial segregation that resulted from the creation of the suburbs un in, under Jim Crow laws originally in the early 20th century, and so this extension of uh, that kind of construction of identity in this home, uh, I think, shows up in both of these stories in different ways. Uh, but I think, you know, for example, this idea in there will come soft rains. Um, you know, all of the fine things of living, the warm things, music and poetry, books that talked, beds that warmed and made themselves, fires that built themselves in the fireplaces of evenings were in this house. And living there was a contentment. This idea that this is your, uh, you know, the, the, the home is your um, your castle, your fortress, like your, your space to be content. Uh, that's something that uh, is really developed through um, appliance technology and home furnishing ideas and just the ways people thought about what they, what they do in their homes. Uh, the idea of the single family home. Anyway, it's, there's a lot of other interesting conversations there, but I think it's a pretty interesting set of things to discuss. Now, I wanted to um, I want to take at least a few minutes here to talk about. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, exactly. Good. Thank you, Jessica Probst. Yeah, um, the uh, J Probst Twelve. I keep uh, there are there are multiple Jessicas, by the way. So it's like it is kind of convenient to refer to you all by your um, Discord names. So J Probst Twelve has put out uh, as as uh, out of the belt. Yeah, that's another great one by Ray Bradbury. Excellent writer. Um, so I wanted to take at least a few minutes here to talk about how to do some of the things that are going to be part of your project this week. And I hoped to spend a little bit more time on it today. 
Um, but I think instead, and this I think this will work better anyway, I'm going to make a few uh, standalone videos about different parts of this process. Your goal is, if you remember last week we looked at GeoCities and the, uh, the different archival versions, that ways you can access the archive of that, like the Wayback Machine or ooCities.org. And your goal, your project for this week is going to be to create a retro style homepage in the fashion of the kind of homepage people would have been making in the mid 90s. <laughs> so this is something that will require a couple of uh, tools and techniques and I'm going to teach you those or I'm going to show you those. Uh, I know some of you have already done some work with HTML and CSS in earlier classes of mine, but many of you haven't. So this might be a review or it might be an extension of things. So I'm going to show you a couple of things now. I'm going to have to move pretty quickly right now, but um, I wanted to get it on the stream and then I'll do I'll do videos or, de or you know, text instructions later um, because I want you to try to get this done this week. So let me switch my screen over. Ah, wrong one, sorry, multiple things. Let's see if this is on the right, so if this scene has the right content on it. And yeah, that'll work. So this is, this is my setup that I like to use to talk about code. And, and this is very similar to the work, the, the layout, the environment that I use when I am actually coding these kind of things. So what I have over here on the right is a web browser. It's pointed to a subdomain on my, on djsd101.net. So I'm going to show you how to create that. And then this over here is, oops, this, 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 this. <laughs> my video is flipped, it's kind of confusing. Uh, this over here, this is the source code of an HTML document, a very, very basic document called, um, with nothing in it other than that text that says Unicorn Central. There's obviously a lot to cover with HTML and I'm not gonna be able to do it in five minutes. Uh, but I wanted to at least show you how to create a subdomain and upload content to it. And then um, I'll give you more detailed instructions later. So this is how we do it. Um, there is a guide for how to do this. If you are in UMW domains, if you go to umw.domains, you can click on help guides and then down here, uh, creating subdomains and subdirectories. There is a tutorial that shows you how to do that. Um, you can also ask me for help or the Digital Knowledge Center for help. But it's usually, creating a subdomain is usually pretty easy. It just uh, takes a couple steps. So to get that, oops, that's not what I wanted to click on. I wanted to click on the control panel. Uh, well, this is it. So you, you need to find your uh, control panel and I've got my window narrow so things are a little different. But what I'm looking for is that right there where it says subdomains. That button right there is the one that's going to take me to the subdomains control area. And this is where I can create subdomains. Now, just to be clear, subdomains go before the domain name. So that's different from the sub, a subdirectory. Subdirectory goes after. And you can see here, like an example of both, actually. This is a subdirectory because it's example.com slash blog. Um, but I am going to actually just create one here. So I'm using djst101.net and I'm going to make my domain subdomain unicorn central. Um, and uh, it automatically filled in this document root. You should leave it the same as whatever it says there. And then hit the button. Hitting this button should just take a couple seconds and it's already done. And what this has done now is it has made this subdomain available. So it's at unicornscentral.djst101.net. So if you were to browse there right now, you would see the same thing that I, that's not right, don't see because it had not fully completed creating the subdomain. Uh, before. Sometimes this happens, if you go there too fast, it will not have finished making the subdomain and then you get this error. Uh, this is related to mapping it. So let's see if I can clear that. There it is, okay. So this is what it should look like. Um, when you first create a subdomain, it's just index of, and then there's nothing there. So this is a blank list, uh, an empty subdomain. This is a folder on the in the storage area for my domain, but there's nothing in it. So this is the this is what it looks like as an empty list. So to get content into it, and I've already made this web page over here. It just has that t that text in it. Um, I'm just going to show you how to upload it. Um, to get that into my domain, I first need to find it in the file manager. So the file manager, let me go back to the cPanel main screen here. The file manager is a way that you can browse the files and folders of your website as though it is a computer, like a computer you're using right now. Um, it's very similar. Uh, the way you can do that is with file manager, which is right here. Well, you can see it. It's the file manager picture of a filing cabinet. And it has yeah, it's everything that you already installed. I have a ton of stuff here. Obviously, I've been doing this for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, browsing around, you see all the different subdomains I've created over the years and 
several projects and so on. Uh, but this is the one that we're interested in, unicorncentral.dgsd101.net. And as you can see, there's nothing in it. So what I see here, this is the same thing that I'm looking at if I look at it here. This is the public view that you can see if you were to browse to this right now. This is the, uh, the file manager view where I can do things like delete this folder or upload new content. So I'm going to upload my content. Now you won't be able to see me clicking through on my computer, the pop-up window there, but you just browse to a file that I had already created called home.html and it's uploaded now. The way this works, for some reason, you have to click to go back. It doesn't automatically go back. Once you go back here, you can now see that that home.html file is in that folder. And now, if I go here, this is the new subdomain I created. If I refresh this, it looks like the same as my other new subdomain that I made as a demo for this that says Unicorn Central. Now, uh, your process, your process for creating this will be um, different in the sense that you should make your web page first before you upload it. And that's, I haven't had time to cover that yet. And I won't right now because um, we're right about at 3.40. Uh, but I will do a video talking about some of these things. I just have to do that uh, this afternoon or later this evening. But uh, the things that you will need in order to be successful for this, you really just need two things. You need a text editor, which I have here. This is Sublime Text. I really like Sublime Text. If you don't know any, like if you have one you like better, by all means use it. Um, but if you aren't sure what to start with, I think Sublime Text is a great one to start with. Um, Notepad++ is also good. Atom is good. Uh, BB Edit is good. There's lots of good ones. Uh, you probably don't want a full-fledged IDE like Python. You can use something called Idle. You don't. You probably don't want that for this kind of editing. Um, otherwise, any kind of any kind of code editor, like literally just if you want to Google code editor, um, that's what we're doing here. And there's several. Um, I have actually I've started using this one, Visual Studio Code. It's pretty good. I'm still just kind of getting used to it. Um, but Sublime Text is good. Lots of great options, right? Um, the the thing is that this is writing plain text. So if you remember from our AI notebook, you had to create a document that was plain text. That's the same thing here. This is a plain text document, but it's a special kind of plain text document because it has HTML markup in it. That's this text that you see here that's pink and purple. Uh, that's HTML markup. It also ends, the file name ends in .html. So that file extension tells Sublime Text this is HTML, and Sublime Text is like, oh, okay, I know what that is, and it colors it accordingly um, following the rules of HTML syntax. So things that are proper HTML will show up colored a, a, a predictable way. That also means that when I upload it into a web browser and look at it in a web browser, a web browser will be able to interpret it as HTML and render it accordingly based on what the markup is telling it to do. So that's the basic idea there. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I just, I have run out of time. So I'm going to make some uh, videos probably with, I'll probably try, I'll try to do like shorter videos about specific things. So like if you just need help uploading, you can just go to that video. And if you just need help getting some blind text, you can just go to that video. Um, that might be easier. So anyway, uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, also, some I had I've mentioned a couple of times maybe sending out a survey to see how everyone was doing with the different face-to-face -face cohorts and if anyone wants to switch um, or not, but I have not yet. I, and I definitely want to continue the way we're doing this week uh, to see through the end of this module at least. And then we, I think after this week, that will be a good time to think about another path if that becomes necessary. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, well, I need to wrap it up because I've been going a bit long, so I will do that. But if you have any questions briefly, you can get them in now. Otherwise, you know, I will say good afternoon to you and, <laughs> and wish you a good evening. Um, by the way, this is random, but I um, hope you're enjoying Eliza. I've got two different bots named Eliza in here. One is all caps and I don't know. I don't know much about the, the well, I know the one that the all caps one is an implementation of the Joseph Weizenbaum bot. It doesn't seem very smart. Like it, it seems to struggle with conversations, I think, because it doesn't have um, like the memory of a conversation, which the normal, the original bot does. Uh, but the other one here, the Eliza, that's like a character, I think she's trying to do a Markov chain kind of substitution on your things you've already written, although I don't, it doesn't seem to work well, or at least I, I get a lot of error messages from it where basically it's like I don't have enough information about you. But I think the idea is like you're supposed to send it a command using that awkward syntax of like question mark FQ, and then it sends back 
um, it sends you back a, a message that is supposed to mimic you or a different user if you if you give it the, another user's name. So I don't I don't really get it honestly. <laughs> but yeah, I like the OG Eliza too, Jay Probst, and Jesse Bear. Yes, I saw that, and that's fine. But I, I will I will reply to you. But yeah, that's fine if you want to go ahead and switch. If you already know that that's what you want to do, then I, I support that. <laughs> yeah, let me see if I can get Eliza to work here. Yeah, and because like so the. OG Eliza only works in that Eliza chat channel, but I wonder if the other Eliza works here. Let me let me test something. Let's see if it works here. I'm just I'm just trying this. Oh, it works. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it does. And I, I wonder if this, I wonder if it actually just reads that channel, like if whatever channel you, you invoke that command, then maybe it just, it just knows what's in that, in that channel. So I don't know, let's try it on another user. And I think the two might be like, like in a Markov chain, you can decide how long the links are in the chain. So maybe that's what that is doing. Let's try. Try it on JProbes 12. Okay, it, got, it seems to have mostly latched on to your most recent comment there, JProbes. Uh, let's try Jesse Bear. <laughs> oh no, I have to actually go down here and I have to retype it. Uh, I can be hacked. Rumors are not smart. I have to worry about because they're convinced everything. It just seems faster and create shopping lists. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interesting. Um, and ironic that Eliza's first comment here is, I can be hacked. Um, huh. All right. Interesting stuff. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to wrap up the stream. Thanks for watching and hope you're doing well. Have a good day. And I will be sending you all some things hopefully later tonight. Bye.